All right, so before we get started uh, today, does anybody have any questions about research or about finding sources? Okay. Yeah, sure. So, for our, so we're finding sources that go with uh -huh. our thesis, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and we can use exploratory reflection two or three. Two or three, yep. Okay. I don't know, I don't know the question I want to have. I, I have uh -huh. a question, I just don't know. Yeah. Like, like, I don't know how, how to, I guess begin, I guess, like, finding. Okay. Like, I know where to go, like, yeah, yeah. Just, but, but you, 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 so, so you can't, like, like, you can't figure out, like, what kinds of keywords you want to yeah. plug in? Okay. I was going to ask because I was planning to do the Virginia Wolf. Okay. Because I did better on that one by surprise. Uh huh. So I was thinking, like, um, would it be more over, like, the women's history during the Elizabethan era, and, like, for as women writers, or, like, uh huh. Yeah, I just don't know like what, like he said, what keywords I would put in of what I'm supposed to be looking for. Okay. Based off of what you said about the piece itself, like the gotcha. comments. So, okay, so, so I think what, yeah, what, what you need to be able to do is take what it is you, you want your main subject to be and break it down into a couple of searchable words, right? Um, start specific. So for something like you, you would maybe go with a chain that looked something like wolf and room of one's own and all right, always make sure you capitalize the end so it's only searching for uh, uh, for um, sources that have these specific phrases in them, right? And history. And if that doesn't turn anything up, then you want to try to broaden a little bit, right? You know, maybe eliminate one of the search terms, right? Maybe eliminate history and just search for stuff that's on wolf in a room of one's own. And then you'll, you'll probably end up having to sort through more stuff, right? But, um... Or maybe instead of saying history, uh -huh. say the Elizabethan history? Because yeah. that was one of the main, where she got, like, her stuff from. Yeah, you can try, you can try plugging in a couple of different um, terms. So you might, like, go with, you know, wolf and a room of one's own instead of history. You know, it might go with, you know, and Elizabethan. Or and Shakespeare, right? So on and so forth, right? If your whatever your your third keyword is doesn't turn anything up, you can try substituting synonyms and see if those turn anything up, right? But yeah, that would be a, where I would start with you. Now, what were you thinking of writing on, Ryland? Um, actually, I want to do how to tame a wild tongue by the lawyer. Um, put it on What's that? I so said I want to do this one because I didn't do as good as I did on the second one. Okay. I'm trying to challenge myself. You're better so. than me. <laughs> <laughs> so use her last name. Um, and um, what were you thinking of doing with? So what, 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 was, what, what did you want to look into? Um, like the, the idea that we talked about, inter... Intersectionality? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so, so you meant like Anzaldua and um, How to Tame a Wild Tongue. And... Intersectionality, and again, um, if if you don't turn anything up on how to tame a wild tongue, um, this is an excerpt from a longer book called uh, La Frontera. So it's 
So you can always substitute that in as well. Just as you know, like, you know, what's the name of it? Uh, La Frontera or Borderlands. Oh, it's right here. It's yeah. Right And now with both of these as well, you could probably also um, do searches that don't involve your specific text as well, right? So for example, if you just wanted to get like a good working definition of intersectionality, you could just search on intersectionality and see what you get. And you could just search on something like women's history mm -hmm. and see what turns up, right? I know you did mention in mine about Spiders, like about the female spiders, how uh -huh. they're more dominant and stuff yeah. like that. Could I put that in there, like when I'm talking about the spiders' web? Because I'm probably going to try to go uh -huh. more in depth about that metaphor. Yeah. Yeah, ab ab about, yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, anything that seems like it might be relevant to you know to your argument about the image, absolutely included. Yeah, I think. Like as a reader, like if I was reading that, I think that would be interesting to add like that anecdote about like the female spider being more yeah. dominant than the male spider. Uh -huh. That would be interesting because I like little facts like that, like just reading. Sure. So you you know. Keep your engagement right in there. Uh huh. Female spiders <laughs> kill the male after mating. Uh huh. Like, well, and and and, 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 and you know, and, and, and the the thing is that like it's also a kind of subtle argument mm -hmm. for women's power yeah, like, in an essay that is largely about realms in which women are invisible, right? So yeah, I, I, I think yeah, that, that something like that would, yeah, you could absolutely work into to the longer essay, sure. Um, the other thing, like the other thing to do if you're, if, you're just, if you're having trouble getting started, and I know I mentioned this last time, just make an appointment with John Wilson. I'm thinking about it, I don't know. <laughs> don't think about it, do it. He will save you lots of time floundering around on your own. <laughs> like seriously, like, like just you know, like fifteen minutes with a reference librarian can save you like two or three hours of work. And especially like at this time of the semester, right? Yeah, we don't got two hours. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you don't, you don't have, you don't have enough, you don't have much time to be floundering around. So yeah, just. Make an appointment with John, um, and he will help you find what you need. I need to find her. I'm thinking of Nemo. <laughs> I have never actually seen Finding Nemo. You've never seen that? I have. Oh my gosh. Um, I just wanted to, before I forget, give that to you guys. This is the, the sample annotated bibliography. Right, so that's not, that, you know, that's not due tonight. It's due Friday. Um, I did see the thing in Georgia Beer. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah, it, it, it's it's due Friday, um, and yeah, that that's just kind of like the basic template for what it should look like, right? So you've got your citation, you've got a couple of you've got maybe three or four sentences summarizing the article, telling me what you intend to do, like how you intend to use it, what you're going to do with it, and then um, you know just one sentence telling me what the credentials are. Of the uh, the person who wrote this, right? what makes them an expert? Like, what makes them worth listening to? Okay, so the annotated bibliography, just format-wise, does it have to be an APA? Because I think this is an APA. Uh, no, this 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 is a this is MLA eighth edition, but it, it, it's Instead yeah yeah. Instead of the left side, it's on the right side, and there's not a name on the top of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go, go. Yeah. Go. Go with uh, um, whatever the most recent MLA edition is. Was this I think it's part it. of our paper. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, this, this this is part of the whole process of writing the paper, right? So everything we're doing over the next two weeks is geared towards getting this damn paper done, right? <laughs> everything that we're doing in the next two weeks is. So, is, so are the writing. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like essentially, what 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 this is asking you to do is evaluate and compare two of the sources you want to use in your paper, right? So you're already doing some of that work that you can incorporate later as we work on the paper, right? Yeah, I saw the two right inside, and I was like, we already got to do a paper for this guy, and he's making us do this to do. Uh huh. And then Hannah was like, well, right. 
he does it for your paper too. And I'm like, still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I'm, it, everything's focused now on stuff you, uh, stuff you can use for the paper. All right, um, any other questions? So what does, I haven't like to read the of these paragraphs, so what does the paragraph tell, like, what are, uh -huh. we, what are we putting actually in the paragraph that we write about these verses? Okay, sure, yeah. so what, what you're putting in is um, the source's basic argument, uh, where it fits into uh, the, this scholarly conversation on this topic, uh, what you intend to do with the source, right? Like, you know, what your purpose is in using it, and the author's credentials. So it's basic argument how it relates to what we're writing about, and then mm -hmm. their credentials. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Remember, cred you know, credentials are important, right? You need to to tell me why I should trust this person as an expert. Are we making them speak to each other? Yes. Like dialogue or is Oh, it... hello. What the? No, you, you don't. Uh, the, oh, there's a winged ant on my hand. Um, that's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been down here now eight years, and like the wildlife and uh, plant so life never. Yeah, it's it's over there somewhere. Like just like never ceases to find new ways to terrify me. <laughs> I am laughing. Every... I had one of those little green spider things on uh -huh. my mask, and I was like, how do you even get and there, dude? Everything's enormous and everything bites. <laughs> Animal or plant. <laughs> and the cockroaches fly. Oh my god, I hate those flying cockroaches. Uh -huh. I would say burn. <laughs> but yeah, too. Um, but you, 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 did, you asked me a question before I found that thing crawling in my eye. Um, what was it you asked me? So with the writing assignment, uh -huh. it's making one of the sources talk to another. So is that dialogue, or how do you want us to do that? No, you're, you're just going to do it in like just ordinary 500-word paragraph form, right? right? If it helps you and you're doing, doing your pre-writing to write it as a dialogue, you know, source X says this, source Y says this, then do that, right? But then try to write it into just like a regular essay format. So maybe you could do sense. like one paragraph about what source X is saying and then another one about Y and then combine them? Um, maybe not, not so much combine them, but think about how they would respond to each other, right? And one thing that you can do, like one model you can use for doing that kind of thinking is like if you look at your sources, you will see there are places where they cite each other. Right, you know, like you know, there'll, there'll always be a place, you know, where one source cites some other source and says, um, you know, blah 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 says, Meh. this is what I think they mean by it, and this is what I think of what they think. Right. So if you, as you're looking at your sources, you can actually get a model for this sort of thing. Right. But. We're going to work on this today, actually. Right? We're going to practice this today so that you feel a little bit more confident uh, actually doing this assignment, right? This is, yeah, our, our whole focus for today is going to be on, on this. Okay, so basically it's like um, a Venn diagram in my paragraph or essay form. Yeah. So you're, how they compare. Mm -hmm. Do we include how they don't? Like how they don't line up, how they're oh, separate? Well, um, as, as long as they're talking about the same thing and where they disagree, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you, you're going to find some spot in your sources uh, where they are talking about the same thing or the same idea. And you're going to find some point of divergence there, right? Like whether it's, you know, they're using different methods or they disagree on an interpretation or something like that, right? And you're going to try to imagine how they would comment on each other's work, right? The goal here is to get you um, to not just plug in sources as answers, right? But to get you to really think hard about the, the larger scholarly conversation that they're all engaged in, that they're all part of, and that you're trying to find a place for yourself in. But again, we'll work on this 
today, right? This is the focus of today's class. Okay. But yeah, um, so apart from that, the other thing I want you to do is read uh, the 15 pages in Writing Analytically on Introductions and Conclusions. Um, I don't, you don't need to read all of chapter 10. We're just going to focus on introductions and conclusions and we're going to do some work on those because when it comes to forms and formats, it's been my general experience that these are the things that students stress out the most about. Um, you know, maybe not this group specifically, but students in general always seem to be worried about whether their introductions or conclusions are any good. I think it's more of like you're feeling like you're repeating yourself, like in the intro and then in the conclusion. Yeah. So like in the conclusion, you're like, I just said everything, so how do you Yeah, do it, it, right, exactly. It's like, like I, I can't say something new in the conclusion. Yeah. But I also can't just go back and repeat what I said in the introduction. So yeah, we'll, 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 get, we'll give you some strategies for dealing with that exact problem. Whether it be a writing assignment, do you that day, or is it just you're reading those pages? Um, well, th this, this is all for Thursday. Right, what I'm saying for the reading, of, uh, so you, we're just reading for Tuesday. We don't have a writing assignment. Um, there will you, you, there will be a small assignment due Tuesday and one due Thursday, but they'll be shorter than usual. And essentially, like the first one will the the, the, the one the one due net the one due Thursday the one due Thursday. No, wait, the one due Tuesday, the one due next Tuesday, the one due a week from today, is just going to be um, evaluating an intro introduction, and the one due. A week from Thursday is just going to be evaluating a conclusion, right? That's it. That's all they're okay, going to be. Okay, so it's not like us writing it. No. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, it's going to be about increasing your confidence by, you know, getting some familiarity with examples, basically. All right. So, making sources speak to one another. So let's start with the issue of why. Why do I want you to write research papers anyway? Right? Why do I want you to go out and cite a bunch of sources for this paper that I'm making you write at the end of the semester? To use what you've been teaching us. It's like a final exam type thing, like just to make sure you know how to write a research paper. Okay. Um, but even outside, like, why do, I, why, why do I think it's important for you to know how to write a research paper? Apart from the fact that it's the, fo you know, that it's the folks in this class and it's essentially my job to do this. <laughs> so that we can make informed, like we can have informed opinions. Okay, like yeah. To back up why we believe in something. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. like when we're talking about like a subject, we have facts to just opinions. Yeah, so yeah, you're learning how to find good information, right? And you're learning how to um, make an informed argument with confidence, right? And yeah, the major thing that you'll get from doing research and familiarizing yourself with secondary sources is expertise. Right, even if you're not majoring in English and you don't particularly care about the thing that you're writing about, and you know, it's not something you're going to be revisiting, you can still use these same techniques, right? these, these same um, methods in your own discipline. Or depending on our field, like how some people who go into the medical field, they do research experiments and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like I'm pretty sure like pre-med, they would have to do that. So. Yeah. But if you are, say, if you're pre-med or if you're, if you're, if you're, a, if you're a bio major um, and you're not familiar with the work that has been done on whatever your subject is prior to you sitting down and doing an experiment, what do you end up having to do? Yeah, you kind of have to reinvent the wheel, right? And that's like one of the nice things, at least um, you know, you know, for the this, the stuff that underlies most of what you're studying, right? Somebody else has already done that work, <laughs> and, 
and you can, you know, you can go back, right, and uh, check on what other people have done, what other people have written, and then you don't need to do that base level work yourself, right? So the first thing that you want to do when you're dealing with a secondary source When you're dealing with sources generally, it's right. Familiarize yourself with all of the sources you intend to use, right? Or at least for you know, when we're dealing with an assignment of relatively small scope like this, right? You're only using say five secondary sources. Now, if you know, so if I'm writing, say, a 20-page article that I want to submit to a journal. I will probably be using like, you know, like more, more, something more like 15 or 20 sources, right? Um, so it's not necessarily feasible for me to really dig deep into all of them before I start writing. But in your case, because you're only using five, right, you can do this. So you want to familiarize yourself with all of your sources first, right? So the first thing that you want to do as you are reading is identify and define key terms. Right. What's the language the text uses? Right. What are the important words here? And you also want to do the same kind of thing you do for your primary sources, right? You, you know, when you're looking for strands, and binaries, you want to do that with your secondary sources too. All right, this will tell you a lot about what kinds of issues your source is concerned with. Now, the second thing you want to be able to do is summarize or paraphrase the source's main ideas. All right, this requires you to pay close attention to the language first, right? And then once you're pretty sure you're, you know what all of the terms mean, you can go and sort of look at what the main points of argument are. And you want to pay close attention to things like evidence, and methods, right? Not just what are the arguments they're making, but what, what's the evidence they're using to get those, to build those arguments? And how are they getting these arguments from that evidence, right? Remember when we talked um, earlier in the semester about that Toulmin method of argumentation? That claim data warrant model? Does this sound familiar to anybody? Is that the one where you like there's one piece of argument and you find many different pieces of it, or is that something else? I think you might be thinking of something else. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, so this <laughs> is so a claim is an argument I make or a statement that I make that requires some proof or some backing, right? So if I make the claim. I am a US citizen, I use a piece of data to back it up, right? I was born in Pennsylvania. Now, I need what's called a warrant to connect the data to the claim, right? The warrant is that justification that I need for making this claim based on this piece of data, right? So what would be the warrant here? What's the logical connection between the claim and the data? Birth certificate. Well, that would be what I need to present, right? Um, um, to be, is like to be considered a U.S. citizen, you have to be born in the U.S. or something like 
Yeah, that anyone born in the U.S. is a U.S. citizen, right? Yeah. Good. So you need to make sure that you're paying attention to all three parts of your source's arguments here, right? Not just what are the claims they're making, but what evidence are they using to make that claim, and what's the logical connection between the claim and the evidence, right? How do they justify making this claim based on this evidence? Right. Remember, we're, you know, we, we, you know, we, we dissect and, and understand before we attempt to evaluate, right? Now, once you have got a pretty solid sense of your sources, then you can start comparing them to each other, right? The first thing you want to look for is common ground, right? In what ways are they similar? What do they all seem to agree on? You might also want to look, as I think I noted last time, for sources that more than one of them cite. Right. If all of your sources are citing a particular source, that suggests that that source is probably in some way foundational to the study of this thing, right? That people regard that source as very, very important. You might also want to look right, for similarities in language or in the kind of jargon that they use, right? Are they using the same kinds of words and are they using them to mean the same things? Once you've established that common ground, that's when you start looking for divergence, right? So think about things like, what are the big disagreements about, right? When two or more scholars are interpreting something differently, what, are the, what seem to be the biggest things that they choose to fight about or to take issue with? Also, look for places, as I said, I think earlier, uh, where, where do they cite each other? particularly when they're attempting to critique each other's work, right? And this will help you to imagine what kinds of criticisms they might come up with of one another's positions, right? Now remember that this all stems from familiarity, right? First, familiarity with each individual source, and then familiarity with the whole field of sources, right? Once you know all five sources pretty well, it becomes easier to do this kind of thing. So what I'd like us to try now um, is to look over this uh, handout that I gave you, the Making Sources Speak to Each Other handout. Um, and I want you to uh, just focus on the first two excerpts, the Henry Louis Gates Jr. and the Daniel J. Royer excerpt. Uh, both of these are concerned with Frederick Douglass. Um, and I want you to start with this, right? Identify and define what seem to you like the key terms, 
And if you need to look up words, I will let people use their phones for this. This is probably the only time I'll ever let you use your phones in this classroom. But uh, you are permitted to do so if you can't define something based on context. And then you get, you're going to look for strands and binaries that you see in these articles. And you're going to try to summarize and paraphrase their main ideas, right? I've got three examples here, just focus on the first two, just the Gates and the Royer. And take your time because if we don't finish, we'll just carry this over into next time.
So we're just doing the first part, or we're doing one and two? Uh, just do the first part for now. Okay, so just identify each term. Oh, and, and, and yeah, summarize and paraphrase the sources of many ideas. If these are, the, you know, so yeah, you're doing these two things right now. Okay. Well, if you, you know, if you feel like you've got a good list of uh, key terms and binaries, then shoot. I don't know if I already have binaries. I was just trying to figure out what they were supposed to talk about. <laughs> well, it's like I get an idea, uh -huh. but it's yeah. like they're trying to make sure I know what I'm talking about. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and and that and that takes a little time, and that takes you know, that's one of the reasons why defining the key terms I think needs to come first, right? You need to understand what the words mean before you can understand what uh, what's at stake in the, uh, in the argument. I kind of want to talk about example one. Okay. Okay, so um, first off, it keeps capitalizing signifiers and yeah. also in parentheses it includes the G. Yeah. Um, yeah, I that Just think about uh, the way um, I sometimes talk, like leaving, is that like purposely that they're doing that, like leaving off, well, including the G? Yes. Uh huh. Um, Nicholas Cresswell, writing between 74 and 77, made the following entry in his journal. In the black song, they generally relate the uses that they have received from their masters or mistresses in a very satirical style, which they do a style differently, um, yeah. and manner. And it says, he strikes at the heart of the matter when he makes explicitly the usage that the black slaves have received. But black people frequently announce their sense of difference by repetition with a single difference. Uh -huh. So is that um is that kind of like an explanation in a way of why they're doing that, like leaving off the G? Yeah, and capitalizing the S every time, yeah. right? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think yeah, this yeah, this is part of Gates's explanation for this, right? So, um, what does it mean to like? What does it mean for something to signify? Uh, represent. Yeah. Yeah, signification is the same thing as representation, right? Like, I, I represent, say, you know, um, a flame with either the word flame or a little picture of a fire, right? So, signifying, spelled in this way, Gates is using, using to mean uh, specifically black American vernacular means of expression. So 
the term of the book is like right there in that first sentence. Um, free of the white person's gaze, black people create their own unique vernacular structures and relish in the double play of these forms more to white forms. Uh huh. So like, and then them including, I think, of like a representation of that, like yeah, including that and like leaving off the end like it was previously, and then putting back in the G. Yeah. The disease. Yeah. Okay, and then I looked up the word enounce. And uh -huh. it said, um, I didn't write it down. But it says, to set forth or state something such as a proposition or to pronounce distinctly articulate. Um, yeah, so, so essentially the same thing as announce. Okay. It's just in, like, I, I think he, he's playing around here with some 18th century uh, non standardized spellings, right? Spelling in the English language didn't become standardized until the late 18th century. Um, so we will often find things in older texts where the spellings look, you know, the spellings of familiar words look strange. Like he's got style here as an example as well. Um, but yeah, um, do we notice any, 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 like, uh, any important binaries here? Or anything that looks like an important binary? Okay, in the first paragraph, I had to look up where it's I don't know. That okay. Word. And then ambiguously. Okay, so that okay. word that starts with as is, is, is defined as brief and clear expressed manner, but then ambiguously means unclear. Yeah. So that's weird that he's arguing that his own book yeah. is both brief and clear, and then also and also ambiguous. Yeah. understands what vernacular means, right? Yes. Uh, you gave me a look like you did not. Um, I wasn't really paying attention, if I'm being honest. I was looking up the other words. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so. Okay. So, so ver vernacular. Oh, just, yeah, I looked up yeah. the word. It's the um, language and dialect spoken of someone by country. Yeah, well, it's, vernacular is really just every, anyone's everyday everyday language, right? Exactly. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you're, you're, you're every, your everyday speech is vernacular. I thought you vernacular. said like with the B, so I didn't hear Oh, the no, B, no. So no. I was like, no, what are you talking about? No, vernacular. Yeah, vernacular. <laughs> okay, any, do we see any other uh, potentially important strands or binaries here? Uh, let, let's let's stick with example one for now. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed you used the word repetition. Uh, okay, yeah. The, are you and, talking about the culture and all? Yeah, and is there another word that he uses frequently alongside it? Oh, in revision. Yeah, repetition and revision. So he <laughs> seems to be relating these things to these two things to each other, right? Yeah, because he says that, and then he says, or repetition with the signal difference. Uh-huh. Which I don't know what he means. Really. Well, I think he's defining revision, that what he means by revision there, right? So, repeti so revision is repetition, but with an obvious difference, right? Okay. So um, to give you an example of the sort of thing he's talking about, um, uh, in like uh, rap music, right? Uh, typically, instead of having a band playing behind the rapper, um, a DJ will take a bunch of samples from different songs and have those, like, like, we'll, we'll kind of like form those into, in, into a new background track, right? Yeah. Um, one in which oftentimes the original track or tracks that are being sampled aren't always recognizable, right? Um, like, I don't, like, I'm demonstrating here that I'm an old person. Um, but I don't know if any of you are familiar with an old Run DMC song called Tricky. Uh, maybe. Okay, it's, hey, it's tricky to rock a rhyme, to rock a rhyme, it's right on time, yes. it's tricky. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, apparently, like, you know, the guitar riff in the background there is taken from 
uh, a hit song from like, 1979 called My Sharona. Um, I know this because I learned that Run DMC had to pay royalties uh, to the Knack, even though it's not recognizable really as a, as, a, as a guitar riff from My Sharona, right? It's used to a completely different purpose. But I think what, what Gates is, is arguing here is that a lot of black American art is built on this same principle, right? You take something, yeah, the, the, you, you take something that already exists and you, and you put a twist on it um, that makes it into something entirely new, right? So he's also, um, he's, he's critiquing what he called, you know, the, the binary that he cites at the end here, the, the imitative versus creative binary that he thinks that, you know, the uh, associates with these 18th century thinkers like David Hume and Thomas Jefferson, right, who were saying that, um, that black people only imitated and did not create. He said, well, actually, in that imitation is creation because they're not just repeating the thing that you gave them. They are repeating it and changing it, right, with a difference. That's you know what the point is of this uh, Nicholas Cresswell quote here, right? You know that he's noting that you know these people, you know that, that you know people are taught a hymn, say by their master or mistress, and then instead of you know singing this you know holy prayer and song to God, they're singing this they're singing it in a satirical manner that makes fun of the people who taught it to them, right? So it's the same words and the same tune. But by changing the tone of it, it's used for an entirely different rhetorical purpose, right? So what does this suggest if we, so as we're getting on to sort of step two here, right? What is Gates suggesting about um, African-American art and culture? Like, what, how would we sum up the basic points he's making here? More talking about how it's very unique, but people see it in a different way. Like they think that that's not proper uh -huh. when it may not seem proper to them. Is uh -huh. how they understand it. Like I mean, you can kind of okay. understand how it's spoken. Sure. You can pick up on what they're saying. It may not be prevalent to you. Like you uh -huh. may not get it, but other their culture does get. It. Okay, I'm think, yeah, if we're thinking about like an artistic strategy rather than a language oh, okay. strategy so much, right? Um, <clears throat> which, um, again, if we focus on, yeah, the different ways he treats sort of like black and white ideas of creativity, right? That he seems to be critiquing white notions of originality, right? arguing that repetition is not the same thing as mere imitation, right? Yeah. Okay, I, I guess I thought it was what you told us earlier in the semester about how there's no such thing as a perfect scenario. Uh -huh. Because you would literally think about repetition and imitation being like, of each other, but like the nuance, so. Yeah. Well, you know, th there was an exercise that I used to do in this class, and it was a little bit less focused on text. I would play uh, the original and then a cover version of the song, and ask the class if this was the same song. And usually, opinion would be divided, right? Uh, because you know, some people, it's, it's the same tune, it's the same words, it's basically the same instrumentation, it's the same song. Well, others that will know, like, you know, this other artist is putting a different spin on it. It's not the same song. And I think that Gates would be falling into that later camp, right? Like, the, you know, the, the idea that you're using the same basic linguistic or artistic structure or materials doesn't mean you're just repeating the same thing. You are actually making something new. That repetition is creative or can be creative. 
at least within a particular cultural context. Now let's see if we can do the same kind of work with the Daniel Royer essay here. So start with any key terms, strands, binaries, and we'll try to work from there. Um, a key term that kind of just jumped out is intersubjectivity. Okay. I was just about to say that. I was thinking, I was like, well, I don't know, I was kind of, I was stupid for a second, I was like, wait, didn't we already look over this? I thought you were making us look over it again, I was like, mm-hmm. wait a minute, okay. Okay, can we infer from context or prior knowledge what intersubjectivity means? I had to look it up. I did look it up. Oh, you did look it up? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought the definition wasn't helpful. <laughs> uh, There's a definition, I don't know. Uh, it's something about like, it's like something about yeah, the existing between two, mm -hmm. between conscious mind. Yeah, but I yeah. mean like subject, like subject to, like being subjective to, like I don't know. Uh -huh. I mean, being objective, you're not, you're like separating yourself from it. Yeah, right. Objective refers to something outside of your own perceptions, mm -hmm. right? So, um, the example I might use for the difference between objective and subjective, right? Um, it's an objective fact, for example, that a particular Picasso painting is made up of a set of geometric shapes arranged in a particular order, right? Um, that is true no matter what angle you're looking at it from or, you know, what your personal experience of abstract art is or whatever, right? However, your personal experience of that painting as an aesthetic object is subjective, right? So yeah, subjective refers to, you know, the individual mind and the individual experience, right? So yeah, intersubjectivity, sharing between more than one mind or more than one person, yeah, that's actually a pretty good definite. I think that is a kind of exactly what is meant here. Um, that is exactly the kind of thing Lawyer is talking about. That <clears throat> um, Douglas's acquisition of literacy um, is intersubjective in a number of different ways. Um, it's comparing readers and writers. Okay, readers versus writers. Yeah. Good. To also be talking about like slave education. Okay. I mentioned I like to talk about Douglas's and then also like slave narrative conventions okay. and stuff like that. Yeah, he talks specifically about slave narrative as a distinct form, right? And do we know what conventions are in this context? If we think about like like what like literary conventions or film conventions, I think of people coming together and like you know talking about stuff they're interested in. And that is one meaning of the word convention, yes. but that is not the meaning um, of okay. convention that is uh, that Royer is using. Um, no, yeah, <laughs> no problem. Um, so what he's talking about here are things like norms and formulas, right? So when we talk about, say, like the conventions of, a, of horror movies, right, these are features that are shared by, by all movies within that particular genre, right? You know, all horror movies have these particular features. So when we talk about conventions, we're talking about a set of shared norms across a particular genre, right? Like how stupid people, like the dumb blonde always dies first in the movies, like stuff like that. Yeah, or, or, or like, like, yeah, if, if uh, um, I mean, my knowledge of horror movies is mostly again, like, you know, from the 80s and 90s, just when I was growing up, when they had this very kind of conservative morality, right, where, um, you know, one of the conventions of the genre was that the first people to die were always rule breakers. 
right? You know, if if, if you know if if, if a, you know a teenager in a slasher film uh, smoked or drank or did drugs or had sex, right? They were going to be, um, a, yeah, they, yeah, they, they were going to be, yeah, they were going to be a victim, right? They were going to be killed by the slasher. Um, whereas, you know, the virtuous, um, abstemious, and virginal characters would survive. The underdogs. <laughs> I know what you're trying to say. I'm like, it's just the underdogs. Little well, berries in the back of the mm -hmm. classroom that you wouldn't think. Yeah, well, in, in, in a horror movie, they're not the underdogs. They're the ones most likely to survive, right? Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so so yeah, what he's saying here is that sl you know, slave narratives have a particular set of shared features, right? That you know, that, that there there are certain characteristics that all of these texts have in common. That's what he's pointing out here. Now, where where else do we see um, potentially important strands or binaries? He does uh, comment, he says, the distinction between merely mastery of rhetorical strategy and subjective uh -huh. awareness is important. Okay. So, well, I mean, we already talked about intersexuality, but comparing that to rhetorical strategy. Yeah, rhetorical strategy versus intersubjective awareness. Good. <laughs> so when we talk about rhetorical strategy, right, then we, you know, we're talking about right, structures of language and modes of persuasion, right? Now given what <clears throat> we have already noted is the definition of, under, of intersubjectivity, what is probably meant here by intersubjective awareness? Being aware of your, uh, being aware of your connection to yeah. the topic or? Yeah, topic. exactly, yes, good. I was thinking there would be like more of like knowing that there's like more than one meaning to something like, you know how some people like uh -huh. minds think of like, thinking of it like that, like how you may be thinking something and someone else also could be thinking the same thing you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Or like if you have a question, someone else may have the same question. So. Think, yeah. I mean, I think it kind of goes too, because I mean, mm -hmm. um, having more than one meaning, uh, knowing, but being aware that something may have more than one meaning. Yeah, yeah, and I think that yeah, like a lot of what's going on here, a lot of what Royer seems to be concerned with here, is how literacy kind of like moves Douglas from one community into another, right? Moves him from the community of the illiterate into a community of the literate, but also then kind of puts him at odds with his background because the um, community he's moving into, right, is one that he is moving into uh, illicitly by the standards of his times, right? It's illegal for him to learn to read and write. So I think in order, I think it's going to take us longer to really kind of pull this stuff out. Um, so I think what we're going to do is stop here now. We'll continue on Thursday, and we'll we'll, fi we'll finish up with this exercise. And um, is everybody getting a good sense here, at least, of what I want you to be doing here with your sources? Yes, this helped a lot. Yeah. Okay, good, good. I'm glad. Can I take a picture of the board? Yeah, absolutely. Good, because I'm probably going to forget what the hell we talked about. Uh, <laughs> so. well, like I didn't really have like a running trip. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you can you can take a picture of the board. Okay, I know you said we we're stopping, but I have a question. Yeah, go um, for it. 
in this example to original and create these mentioned original and creative voice and then conventions and expressive traditional traditional boundaries. Would that be like a, a, a binary? Yeah, binary. Being like original and creative and then conventions. Yeah, original and creative versus conventional. Yeah, no, yeah, that, that would absolutely. Yeah, good. I forgot about that. Original and creative versus conventional. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, you know. Usually, when you accuse you know someone or something of being too conventional, right? You know, what you're essentially accusing them of being unoriginal, right? Trite. Yes, trite. <laughs> Good word. Good, good. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I wouldn't assign it if I didn't think you could do it, so. Yeah. <laughs> this is why, like, it's just with the end of the semester. Yeah. Everything is just piling on and mm -hmm. on. We have a stupid exam tomorrow, and I'm just like, bro. No, I, I, I get it. <laughs> I was, I was in your position once. <laughs> You're in our position longer, man. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, 